by having the public-private partnership approved and possibly working with either Straub or, or whoever else may be willing to provide services here, we can help reduce these losses. Hopefully we can help expand the services that are here. Working with the other um, services that they provide, they can bring their expertise with their electronic medical records, their ongoing efforts to deal with ICD-10 that I mentioned earlier, and allow us to proceed and instead of just move up, but just totally lift the bar and avoid these types of closures and allow us to expand the services that are provided here. So ultimately, cuts equal cuts equal cuts. It's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And so ultimately, please be considerate of the fact that at some point, if privatization isn't looked at, we're going to be even worse off than we were. I don't know if everyone can see this chart. It's maybe a little difficult to see for some of you in the back. But it shows the revenues of the hospital from 2008 through 2014. What you'll see is the revenues have significantly increased during that time due to some of the work that Wes and the, and the board has done by increasing the services of the hospital, providing cardiovascular services, things of that nature has really um, enhanced the revenue throughout those years. You'll also notice expenses have gone up as well. And you can see through 2013 we were progressively getting better, but as we hit 2014, those losses started to get significant. Next. And as summarized here, again, the start of the cardiovascular program, we got more people using the, the facilities during those times and generally enjoyed more use of the hospital. We looked at expenses and ways to keep those under control and they were working. We thought around 2012, 2013, things were working out pretty well going, going forward. You will remember 2008, 2009, the board took it upon itself to start the process of looking for partners. We opened a discussion and was, were looking for people that maybe could come and assist us. We began to notice, despite the increased revenues, that the ability to recruit doctors, the ability to deal with an electronic medical record program, that we needed more resources. We needed people with economies of scale that would help. And you'll probably remember we did bring in talk to, to Banner for a while. Those discussions have been ongoing because through Wes's help and the board's review, we began to see that this maybe is not sustainable. So going forward, <clears throat> we see that 2013 to 2014, our revenues aren't in increasing as much as they were in prior years. We began to see that we're starting to cap out on the revenues that we can generate from the hospital. Our bed capacities were high. We were full significant amount of time and we were having much more difficulty. Physicians were retiring, difficulty providing services within the community. You'll also see the expenses increasing. We're having expenses due, due to the electronic medical record implementation. And then also you'll see there ICD-10. ICD-10 is a coding that's required for billing purposes that the federal government has required all hospitals to fit to implement, which is significantly more expensive in terms of people that have to provide the coding for, for the billing. And those issues have come and affected our overall operation. Between 2013 and 2014, we reduced the number of full-time employees, yet our costs for the employees' wages and salaries continued to rise. Continuing forward, now into what we are in 2015, we begin to see again our revenues not being able to increase, but our expenses increasing even further. Added to this, in 2013, the legislature passed a law that is requiring the institution to start making payments towards the unfunded contributions to the state employee retirement system. The state employee retirement system uh, for the health component, which is what we pay, is unfunded to the tune of approximately $8 billion. And so what the legislature has required is that the amount that we contribute not only 
takes care of current employees, but is starting to pay for the past deficits that exist. And that was imposed on the hospital by law. So those costs came in here as well. So this is going into 2016. Again, you see our income, our revenues not going up very high. These are projected increases. Yet you see our expenses. While salaries and wages are controlled primarily by the state of Hawaii and the government, the costs we do control, medical supplies, purchase services, and, and fees, we've been able to maintain. Yet, with the costs going up and the revenues not rising significantly, we find ourselves in a very difficult position. So we, here we have just a, a quick summary of, of some of those costs that have occurred. $10.7 million. This is the amount I word, referred to earlier, which is to pay for the retirement health fund. These are the past obligations. There are funds that remain outstanding, and this number will continue to increase. As we look forward, as you can see in the bottom, our cash flow is projected to be a deficit of about $28 million, 11 million of which is those salaries that are not our current employees, but our past employees and obligations that we can't control. Those are obligations of us with, have, with the state employee system. So on to our contingency planning. Next slide. As the board set out to look at this issue, our primary goal was to keep the quality of care provided here on the island at a level that we've worked on so diligently over these years to maintain that. We didn't want to go and look into those types of areas that would affect cardiovascular care, stroke care, general surgery care, those things that we've worked so hard to get to. And so we looked at areas where maybe we could cut but have other people take over. As you know, earlier we cut adolescent health. That was based upon the assumption that services could be provided on Oahu and by other care providers here in the state. We've come to find out that many of those services are overtaxed and are unable to pick up that load. As we start looking for these other services, those concerns exist as well. We've thought about maybe we won't provide those services that we've worked so hard to bring here. People can go to Oahu to get them and we found that even on Oahu it's difficult to get services. Those hospital facilities are very busy and overflowing as well. But we continue to do as part of our priority of looking at options to use some of this matrix. As we discussed, some of the lower margin services, which are not profitable um, each year, adult behavioral health that we talked about earlier, something that's near and dear to me, OBGYN, all three of my daughters were born here at the hospital, but overall, the expense of providing those services is operated at a loss. And as a community hospital, as a community member, I feel it's our obligation to provide those services. So it's very difficult to look at that. However, if you're just looking at it as sole revenue and expense analysis, certainly the OBGYN and the oncology are areas that would probably be subject to review and consideration. We also looked at other areas that are maybe not clinical. Maybe cutting some of these costs would still provide the care provided I mean, allow us to provide the same amount of care, but reduce the cost. We have maintenance contracts, our parking valet program. Certainly that doesn't affect technically the care, but it certainly affects your access to the hospital and the care provided in terms of getting in and out of there. The chaplaincy program, very difficult to consider that. But if you're looking at cost, these are considerations that have to be made. In addition, we certainly, um, you can get food in the cafeteria. We may think of terminating that service, maybe terminating security. As you start looking into some of these areas, security is a very good example. As you cut that, you create other problems. And it's very, very challenging to look at what those areas that really could withstand a cut and not affect you in some other way. As we continue to look further for amounts to save up to $28 million, well, now we get into services. Endoscopy, it's a profitable service. Maybe that could be provided on another island, such as oncology. 
But then you realize we have the only infusion center other than Kaiser here on the island, requiring the community, our friends, our neighbors, to have to travel to Honolulu to get those services. Again, something we're desperately trying to avoid. Other services that we have worked hard over the last five years are cardiology program. There's about 115 people who had either open heart surgery or other types of cardiac surgery here that would have otherwise had to go to Oahu. Good friend of mine, I think everyone, he was in the paper, Judge Bisson. He wouldn't have been here without our cardiology program. And having to cut that program is painful. We have orthopedics. Again, having orthopedics here, car accident, broken bones. It's just difficult to think that we'd have to ship people to Oahu to do that. The neurosurgery and the gastroenterology program. Again, similar issues. That the profitability is not there. The service should maybe considered to be cut. Another difficult issue. Physician call. The physicians that appear at the hospital are there on call 24 hours, seven days a week. And whether they show up at the hospital or not, they need to be available. About six, seven years ago, the hospital, to make sure the physicians were always available and were willing to come to the hospital, began to pay them to be available on the hospital, whether they showed up or not. So they knew that they would be able to be paid if they showed up. We may have to consider cutting that. If we do cut that, it's very likely physicians would refuse to provide that service and may not be at the hospital when all of us may need them to be there. And again, a very, very challenging issue. How do we deal with it? How do we deal with the ramifications of those cuts? Lastly, as I've been mentioning, all of these decisions come with ramifications. If you cut the services, you lose the revenue. And it becomes a downward trend which requires you to just keep cutting, keep cutting, keep cutting because of that loss of revenue. There's not always an uh, exact dollar for dollar balance for that. We have existing overhead. We can't afford to lose the ability to pay for that overhead, so those become issues as well. If we do agree to reduce positions, there's a required process in which we give notice and those positions, it takes time for them to be terminated. Several months for that to occur. Those people who are terminated, depending on their seniority, could reposition within the hospital, which creates a domino effect. Very difficult for us to predict how that would all be resolved. We discussed the elimination of the physician call, um, which would possibly reduce the services provided at the, at the hospital and probably have everyone sitting at the emergency room and creating holds and problems there as well. And then lastly, as I mentioned, it becomes a downward spiral. If you close your oncology program, all the other services that a patient would receive from that program while in the hospital would be removed as well because they're no longer there for that service. So just closing one type of service, again, has this domino effect on the other services that are provided at the hospital. You look at cutting maybe a $5 million service at the end after you analyze the revenues and the expenses, it could be a $10 million hit to the hospital. So it's very, very challenging to, to look at this. 